Last week we said, in the same way that a trauma negatively impresses the mind, we can also positively impress the mind through spiritual realization, you know, an epiphany, a flash of insight. When you see the universe differently for the first time, not through the intellect, but through the heart, where you actually recognize a kind of shared being with the universe, a kind of sameness within yourself and the universe around you. These are the realizations we uh, practice having as often as possible so that the mind will be gradually reoriented more and more in their direction and more and more away from the direction of ego and separation consciousness. So last week we said, hey, if you can actually amp up the intensity, the ferocity, the um, I think about the term in the New, New Testament, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force, Jesus said. Interesting teaching, isn't that? The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And now that's kind of a poor translation of the, the Greek words that are being used there. The, a more accurate translation of that would be the kingdom of heaven is apprehended through intensity of desire. And those who have intense desire take the kingdom by force. By force of what? The intensity of my desire. The intensity of my seeking. How bad do you want it? And a lot of times what we do is we try to make up for our lack of intensity with more frequency and more repetition, right? Well, if I just sit here and repeat I am all day, maybe I'll realize something. I am, I am, oh, freaking emails, I gotta do these emails. Hi Stan, it's me, uh, like, oh yeah. I am, I am, I am, oh God, I gotta answer these text messages. And it's like, do you think any real change will happen to the mind that way? Are you sending a strong signal to the mind that it needs to adapt? Are you impressing the mind with a greater stimulus? Or is that just kind of the mundane status quo? So in terms of, I want to say, pursuing a deeper realization of the universe, when we fall in love with a, a teaching, an understanding, or a framework, we may hear it through different teachers, different texts, right? The law of one for me was one of these frameworks that I just fell in love with and it increased my intensity of desire to apprehend the kingdom, meaning to understand and know and experience the universe as it really is. Another framework that I want to give you today, which we've actually touched on before, of what I like to call verb consciousness. So we have two different ways we can see the universe. Separate, separation or unity, separation or oneness, yeah? These are the only two options. And you're, you're only ever somewhere between those two, right? It's a spectrum, let's say, of how much do you perceive and desire oneness or how much do you perceive and desire separation? Whatever you wish to see is what you shall see. So that's why the intensity is a huge factor in the equation of want to see the real universe more and you shall move more towards this end of the spectrum. More awareness of oneness, the nature of oneness. So verb consciousness, this framework, is gonna give us a really powerful way to apprehend the kingdom of oneness. Understanding this difference between verbs and nouns. So let's just cut right to the chase. We live in a universe of verbs. There are no nouns in the universe which is to say, we live in a universe of verbs, vibration, motion. We live in a universe of vibration, right? Nikola Tesla, if you wanna understand the universe, you can only know it by thinking of energy, frequency, and vibration. So we live in a universe of motion, yeah? Activity, uh, movement. There's nothing static in the universe and a noun implies a static object something that isn't in motion. Because as soon as something's in motion, we call it an activity. As soon as we see something we believe is static, objective, we call it a noun. But nouns do not exist because everything is motion. Are you tracking? So a noun is literally a made up concept by the mind. In reality, there are no nouns. In reality, there's only activity. 
And so this is where we start to understand the Advaita, you know, the Hindu teachings of Maya, the, the world of illusion. Maya is illusion. All is illusion. The, the sutras and the Upanishads all say this. Everything you seem to see is not as it appears. How so? Because you see nouns and in reality, there's only verbs. There's no matter in the sense of a static, unmoving object, a fixed object. There is no matter. There's only movement, motion, light, right? Everything is light. This is already proven by science, quantum mechanics. Everything is quantum entanglement, the vibration of the photon at different frequencies and in different relationships. But it's always just those two polarities, positive, negative, and the undulation between the two. Everything in the universe is just undulating between positive and negative, right? Rhythmic balanced interchange. That's the law of the universe. So in, in that framework, all laws, every law in the universe is really just, you know, those two polarities. We have the law of gravitation and its opposite counterpart radiation, or we say sometimes absorption and radiation, right? Negative positive, um, expansion, contraction, positive, negative. So everything in the universe that we call form is the sort of like alternating electromagnetic pulsation of the photon. Yeah. In different patterns and different relationships at the quantum level. But when it's, when those vibrations and movements are stacked and stacked and stacked and stacked forever, billions and billions of times out. And we zoom out, we appear to see, a object, a noun called a body. But is there actually an object called body or is it all movement and motion appearing as body? So that's the illusion, right? Is that you think you see a static object and everything is motion. Everything is vibration. Uh, even uh, Walter Russell has this great quote, matter is motion in opposition, meaning when that undulation of positive negative, when the force grows so great, the opposition of positive negative coming against each other, that as that continues to stack the opposition of motion, it looks like there's an object there. So for example, we've all seen a tire, whether it's a bike tire or a car tire with, with the rims, right? And the rim, when it's not moving, has all these huge gaps in it. But as the car picks up momentum and the wheel turns faster and faster, eventually that rim starts to look solid and it eventually will look like a solid non-moving circle. Yeah. And even to the point where we can touch any point of that circle and we're going to hit something, but there are gaps, there are huge gaps in between the rim, but we're only ever touching matter because it's moving so quickly. So like, what if that's a microcosm? of what your body is. Does that make sense? Your body is a bunch of particles that are in, in motion, zoomed out, stacked on top of each other so many times. That's the density we talk about. So that when we zoom out, it looks like there's a, a matter there when it's really just the activity of light. There is a beautiful verse from the Ashtavakra Gita that says, I am light, nothing but light. When the world arises, I alone am shining. I am light, nothing but light. When the world appears, I alone am shining. So it's a poetic way of saying I am light. Everything is light. There's only one light. Light exists as light always and forever, right? Matters, nothing but a variation of light in motion, which means there is no death in the universe. Life is eternal because light is eternal. So the cause of all motion in the universe, all activity is the thinking of the one universal being. Sometimes we say the universe we see is like, almost like we're looking at the inside of God's mind. We're looking at the activity of God's mind. If everything we see then is God's thinking, then that means we can't act apart from that mind. And in, in non-doership, we say we can't act apart from the universe life. Any idea that you are acting, you are doing something independently of life, apart from life against life is an illusion. 
it's there's only one life that that lives and moves and has its being and so when I identify as a person who's doing a thing, I'm introducing a noun, right? I'm introducing a noun that's doing a verb. But again, in reality, there's only the verb. There's only the activity. The periodic table of elements is basically showing the record of the original patterns of motion that the Logos designed. We're looking at the first patterns of motion that let's say the the star the sun created when when the sun decided what elements will exist in my solar system so every element then is a different pattern of movement of vibration and they seem to have different qualities right they seem to be uh, unique but they're all the same substance of light in vibration so we have these qualities that that make them appear to be different from each other Right? Each, each element on the periodic table has a different temperature, uh, atomic weight, uh, melting point, mass, color, density. There's all these different qualities, but they're actually just the different variations of movement that each element is containing. And then we, those elements make up all matter. <laughs> all life, all form we see are, is a combination of those elements. And so we have sort of like matter and motion in our awareness. We think that they're two different things, but matter is really an effect, right? Of the motion. So motion is cause, matter is effect, right? Matter is what motion is doing. So that's why we say reality only contains verbs. A human body, as we just said, is nothing but constant dynamic motion from the gross level. You know, my heart beats, my blood circulates, my, my lungs breathe, motion, 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 all the way down to the quantum level, every electron, every proton, every particle, everything in between that spectrum, all of it is motion appearing as matter. So this is the holographic universe theory that we're all familiar with. Scientists have perceived this fact and said, Hmm, everything's just light in motion. Uh, the things that we call real uh, objects, they're made out of things that we don't consider to be real. Waves of light. You know, we don't consider that real. We consider the objects we see as real. But in reality, it's the opposite, isn't it? The, the motion itself, the activity itself is what's real. And that's what creates the illusion, Maya, that there's matter here. So everything we're seeing is an activity in God's mind. So we've all heard that before, but can we see that from a deeper level that it's actually true physically, scientifically, and metaphysically? Literally everything is activity in the one being, the one energy, the one universe. So just like each element, just like your body, your personality, your entire expression is literally a unique state of motion of light. We say, I am the one expressing as Aaron. That one expressing as Aaron is a unique variation of light's movement. Isn't that amazing? If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't think anything can. You, your expression, you call the name you give yourself, that is a unique activity in God's mind formulated through the unique variation and vibration of energies, combinations of energies. And we're talking trillions of combinations and layers of energy and motion that, it, that creates you. But your essence, right? Your form is pure light. We see this in, you know, the ocean is one of the greatest analogies for this. When you see like waves crashing up against the shore and then all the sea foam forms from that crashing and then it washes back into the ocean. Eventually, the, the foam appears to dissipate. So the mind says, ah, foam and water, two separate things. But in reality, it's the activity of water at a different rate of vibration, a different state of movement. That's all that foam is, is just water in a different state of motion. And when that motion loses its inertia, it dissipates back into the ocean. The same original substance. That is what the whole universe is like. But instead of ocean, we have light as the principle. And light has an infinite ability to vibrate in different patterns and rhythms 
and then stack those rhythms and stack those patterns and create any form conceivable by the divine mind. Pretty incredible to consider the intelligence of the creator, that it is a formless, dimensionless thinking mind forever and ever. And all it's thinking about is who am I and expressing that question in form. So now we've solved the great mystery of the universe, haven't we? <laughs> Why is my mind not able to see reality as it actually is? Why do I project a universe of separate things and I suffer at the hands of those projections? Well, it's because my thinking mind doesn't have the ability to be aware of the constant movement and activity within everything. It's too fast for the mind. And so the mind can't see the constant state of change everything is engaged in, the constant evolution and vibration going on. It just sees a noun. That's the best the mind can do. It can just say, oh, instead of, um, you know, Aaron, seeing Aaron as an activity, a thought of God currently unfolding, I see Aaron as a separate static object. And that's a noun. And so the, the mind does that with everything, labeling everything as a noun. And then thus a universe of nouns, AKA separation is created because the mind can't see motion as a thing. It's unable to see verbs. And so then we hear teachings like non-doership that says you are not doing anything. You are not the doer of actions. Why? Because there are no nouns that do something. There's just verbs. There's just the doing itself. So we can say, um, awareness is happening, observing is happening, but there's no observer, meaning a noun, a person that's doing the observing. We can say breathing is happening. And this is actually the way to begin really integrating non-doership in that non-doership is the understanding that everything is the activity of spirit. Everything is the activity of divine mind, verb consciousness. And so because everything is just different states of motion, we should never take personal credit for any pattern that we observe within us because then we're introducing a noun again, because even your body that you're claiming is doing it is an activity. And that activity is gradually refining your state of consciousness. It's happening whether you know it or not. It's happening whether you want to cooperate with it or not. Nobody can escape the constant activity of motion. That's why evolution is a principle, a law in the universe, because nothing can be static. Like if you, if you really think about the idea of your body being a noun, that would mean there was no movement or change happening in your body. You can't have a noun that's constantly changing because that would be a verb. So the idea that I am a noun is a total contradiction of logic in that sense, because we know the body is in constant change. And if you don't keep up with that change and have a loving relationship with that change, you create a state of what we call sickness in the body. So one of the remedies to this is to just see activity itself and erase all nouns and just see activity itself. And so rather than saying, I'm jealous, you can just say, oh, jealousy is happening or there is jealousy. Lying is happening. You know, you, you notice yourself telling a little white lie to get someone's approval of you. And then you go, oh, lying is happening. So you're just witnessing the pattern. And then if it helps you, I'll also give the, uh, the qualification, which you can say, not my doing, which you're really just saying, not a noun's doing. So anger is happening, not my doing. Uh, fear is happening, not my doing. Greed is happening, not my doing. Insecurity is happening, not my doing. There's no person who's choosing to be insecure. There's no person who's choosing to be angry. Why would you ever choose to be in fear rather than love? There's no one choosing this stuff. So not my doing, it's just happening. So just recognize the pattern and in that way, this is not a form of bypassing, but of observing the patterns happening within us so we can transmute them into light. Remember, it's the nature of a mistake to be corrected 
when it's recognized. Uh, Pedar says, but can I choose to react? You don't choose your reactions, right? The, the anger is the reaction. The insecurity is a reaction and it just happens. Why? Because the ego has a lot of karmic inertia built up and that karmic inertia, that's a kind of vibration. It's a kind of motion. Suppose God had two children and we know that God is love, perfect love. God cannot force its will on anyone. God uh, accepts everyone as they are. God does not impose itself on anyone. And so this perfectly loving God creates two children and one child says, ah, I want to grow up in total devotion to you, Father. I want to serve you and love you with all my heart and serve your creation. And God says, thy will be done. The other child says, I want to live in total separation from you, Father. I want to never know of your existence or my oneness with you. And God says, thy will be done. So if a, if a person chooses to live in that state of consciousness, God says, thy will be done. The universe doesn't impose itself and say, no, 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 oh, you're not allowed to be negatively polarized. You're not allowed to see separation. It says, thy will be done. You're the creator here. So we choose a universe of separation. We live according to it. And every action we commit from separation consciousness generates karma. Why? Because separation isn't a fact. It isn't the truth of the universe. Oneness and unity and relationship is the truth. Relationship is the inescapable reality of the universe. So we can't actually be in a separate universe. We can only pretend to be. We can only imagine that we are. And the universe will allow us to imagine that we're in a separate universe, but it will not make it true in reality, meaning there will still be consequences to living in opposition to universal laws. You're allowed to, but you're not allowed to escape the consequences. Why? Because the universe is balanced. There has to be perfect balance in the universe always because God is balanced. Source is balance. Source is perfection, wholeness, balance. So the universe is in that state as a reflection of source. So if you violate oneness, if you live like you're separate from others, you judge them, you attack them, you enslave them, you manipulate them, you fear them, you're creating karma that's coming back to you, energetic inertia that will give you an equal experience of what you projected. And that's how you gain the ability to become aware of your distortions and go, wow, I really suffer a lot when I judge people. <laughs> Wake up, you're dreaming, yeah? And so we can say, hmm, maybe if I do whatever the opposite of judgment is, I'll feel better. And then the source begins to wake up in the dream. Oh, I am love. Love is the opposite of judgment. Love feels like home. Love feels like what's right and what's natural. That's how the universe inspires evolution. You cannot escape the karmic consequences of your activities and separation. And so in that way, there isn't a person choosing activities. There's just the inertia of separation itself that it creates and it continues to act upon the mind and the body. And that's what causes evolution to continue unfolding. So when we observe those patterns without judging them as wrong, we just say, oh, just a pattern. There's just a pattern of jealousy that keeps appearing in me. So jealousy is happening. I see that. And just by seeing that sort of mistake of jealousy, and again, it's a mistake because it's based in separation and separation is false. There isn't separation in the universe. So we just realize, oh, I was just thinking incorrectly. That's the attitude that verb consciousness will give us. It just sort of depersonalizes everything because there's nobody to blame for anything. There's no nouns to be blamed. It's like when the wind blows, and it's a really strong gust of wind and it blows your hat off your head or something. Who, who turns to the wind and curses the wind for that? Maybe some people do, but <laughs> we would consider those people a little loopy, right? Uh, who are you cursing? It's just wind. There's nobody there. In the same way, life just happens like the wind just blows. It's all just energy in motion and patterns of energy colliding and recreating new forms and appearances. And so when something happens, we say, just accept it. You couldn't have changed it as if you could halt the universal motion and then manipulate it in your favor and then restart it again. Ah, there's a good outcome. It's a total fantasy. 
So verb consciousness really gives us the framework to understand and transcend the third belief of ego, I am the doer. There can't be a person that is the doer when there's just activity. There's just verbs. There's just the, the vibration of light. And it's, it's happening throughout the whole universe simultaneously. Uh, this is why mandalas are a powerful spiritual tool we can use to start to digest this kind of nature of the universe as fractal in that we look really close at a, at a mandala and there's like little figurines and forms, right? That look like little paintings. But as you zoom out, they're connected to a bigger painting and a bigger painting and a bigger painting. And when you zoom out far enough, what you once saw as the only object of your vision, the little pattern, is now just like a little window dressing on one of the big patterns of the mandala. But there was always a bigger picture that you weren't seeing when you were zoomed in. So this is all that's happening in ego consciousness. <laughs> you are zoomed in to this person and not taking in the full picture. So the transcendence of ego consciousness is really just the realization of universal consciousness. The, the consciousness of the one being, which is appearing as everything, pure light. It's understanding the greater transcendent dimension of what you are. That if there is light, I am that. If consciousness is happening as an activity, I am that activity. Right? There's no person doing an activity, there's just activity. I am consciousness itself. I am existence itself always and forever going on and on. And you can actually know yourself as that, but to know yourself as that, I am a divine idea in the mind of God. To know yourself as that, you have to see it everywhere else as well. This is kind of what A Course in Miracles emphasizes very strongly is you can't just keep salvation to yourself, right? You can't say, oh, I am a divine idea in God's mind and all these people are jerks and idiots. You just lost it, right? You're back in noun consciousness, back in the universe of nouns. Instead, I am a divine idea, which means everything's a divine idea. And you can only keep it by constantly giving it away. And living in verb consciousness, practicing living in verb consciousness is that way to practice giving it away. If I just see everything as a verb, there is leafing, there is treeing, there's peopling, everything's an activity. Everything is alive with motion and energy. There's nothing static or dead in the universe. If I'm giving that away to creation, the mind only can apply a concept unilaterally. That's why we say the way you are with one thing is really the way you are with everything, right? The same pattern you hold will show up at every level of yourself in some way, your diet habits, your lifestyle patterns, your speech patterns, your behavior patterns. They will all reflect this same distortion if you're holding it. That's because the mind can only apply something unilaterally. So there's great, great power in practicing perceiving the universe correctly. The Course calls it true perception. Because at a certain point, when you have so totally applied verb consciousness to everything, then it will become solidified as a new abiding state. And the mind will just run that way automatically. Meaning there's no other framework that's still trying to oppose verb consciousness. You have so disavowed your belief in nouns that the mind can't apply it in your perception anymore. And so then there's just the pristine awareness of the universe as it is. So to recap, when we observe a pattern in ourself, be very aware of that part of your mind that wants to identify and make you feel guilty. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't be thinking this thought. I shouldn't be feeling this feeling. And you can go right to that remembrance. Oh, there's no noun that's verbing. <laughs> there's just verbs themselves. So lying is happening. The activity of lying is happening, but it's not my doing, just a pattern of energy. And as we see that pattern of energy, the awareness is light. Light is awareness, consciousness, the seeing of it, the putting something into the light transmutes it into light. The pattern will start to dissolve as you continually observe it. Right. Bypassing is when you try not to look at something. So if you're saying, mm, I accept that lying is happening, I'm just not going to take personal credit for it because I'm not going to introduce a noun in God's universe of verbs. Then we can see it purely. 
If we see a person doing an activity, we're seeing dualistically. We're seeing two things going on, so we're not really taking in the full picture as reality knows it. So we have to get rid of the noun in the equation and just say, hmm, greed is happening, not my doing. But nevertheless, I recognize that pattern of greed happening within me. Just the boldness and the courage to accept the pattern itself happening is what performs the healing. And that's, that's subtle purification we're talking about. On, on the gross level, we let ourselves feel that emotion, uh, whatever the emotion of, of greed would be. We let ourselves feel that. But then in the mind, we say, greed is a pattern that's happening, not a person's doing. There's no one guilty, it's just happening. Karmic inertia is playing itself out through the mind body. And that's when we can begin to step back into loving relationship, right? When we notice a pattern, an egoic pattern happening, or a karmic pattern, let's say, we notice where we're still taking and keeping, right? We're still living in separation. And so we just say, ah, oh, greed is happening. Let's move back to giving and receiving. And thus we have seen and accepted shadow and light. We haven't made either right or wrong. We've just seen them as they are. And the negative path is the path of that which is not. So it isn't bypassing to see the false as the false. It's only bypassing when you don't want to recognize the false as false. It's only bypassing when you don't want to let yourself feel what falsehood feels like. But if you feel that falsehood and say, ah, there's the lie of separation acting within my mind-body unit, that is the acceptance of the shadow because the shadow is the negative polarity. It is separation. It's playing a purpose, right? It's fulfilling a function. As we said, it's there to drive you to evolution and growth. So if you don't really own that pattern in you, you haven't truly looked at your shadow yet. So verb consciousness is a way that gives us that boldness and courage and fearlessness to just accept all the patterns within us because we stop personalizing them. We stop making them my pattern and, oh, I'm so guilty. I should have known better. I should have done better. We're just keeping the pattern going, right? We're energizing the pattern. We're giving it reality. But Maya says it's all an illusion. There is no person who is sinning. It's all innocent. So the depersonalization of our shadows, of our distortions, is the way we unlock their healing and their transmutation back into light.